this will be the, the final message on, on this series uh, about true worship, entering into God's presence. And it reads there, if you have, have it there, 1 Kings 18.20. I'm going to read the first two verses there, 20 and 21. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people who said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're doing in people's lives as we purpose in our heart to separate ourselves from the world and to lock arms with you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd give us the grace to make the right choices in everyday decisions as we talk to people, make business deals, and, and move forward in our life, that we would do everything in a godly fashion because we want to really worship you in spirit and in truth. We don't want anything to get in the way. No foreign gods, no foreign thoughts, no false idols. We want to be with you, Lord. We don't want to be caught in between two opinions. Thank us. Thank you, God, for helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Worship. I've been serving the Lord a little while now. And I and I convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, true worship is is assisted by your troubles, by your tribulations. See, these things bring us to an understanding of how God is, who God is, that He's a holy God. We tend to be a people who cry and look up to God when things ain't going well, right? And that's okay. God knows that. He made, he, he made us. He knows all of that, our tendency. But if we're wise and we use them, after God delivers us, because he does deliver us, he heals the pain, takes away the hurt. After that, if we're wise, we never forget the tribulation. Because if you forget it, then you have a tendency to repeat it. Right? Never forget it. Use it to get you closer to God and stay at that position. See, when we worship and we get close to God, we recognize that we're sinful. <clears throat> well, if there's anybody here not sinful, uh, forever hold your peace, amen. <laughs> but our, who we are, it changes us. When we, come, we meet God, we realize we're sinful, we, we want to change the way we're thinking. We want to renew our mind. Every now and then, even as a pastor after 32 years walking with the Lord, something will make me want to revert back to where I came from. And I go, whoa, where did that come from? I remember that dude. Amen. I lived with him for a little while. He's nothing nice. I go, I don't know. Get out of here. God, help me. You know, I can imagine God, what's, what's wrong now? I see myself again. Because I want to change my mind. I want to renew the way I think. And when we do that and we're consistent over a long period of time, it, being, it brings power into our life. We have power, anointing. In worship, we found the last three weeks that Isaiah's worship moved him to fight. You know, he just got tired. Enough was enough. And it says there in 1 Kings 18, 26. And we're going to read a few more scriptures here so that we can balance off what we've been talking about the last three weeks. And it says there, So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. This was the battle between the prophet of Baal and, uh, and uh, Isaiah's God. Then they called the name of Baal from morning, from morning until noontime. What is that? Four hours, five hours. That's some heavy demonic worship. It said they were shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. They danced. They hobbled around the altar that they had made. And they did all this. And you can read more there in, in, in 1 Kings 18. But then if you go down to verse 30, then it was Elijah's turn. Elijah said, then Elijah called the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. 
and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons, three gallons of water. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces of wood. Then he said, now, now, now let's stop there before we go. Imagine the picture. Elijah gets a bull. And he said he cut the bull to pieces. Now we don't know how bull, how big a bull is. But we've seen cows. And they're not, they're not like a little puppy. They didn't have miniature bulls. Right? They had bulls. A bull. That could be anywhere from 600 to 1,000 pounds. And it says, so that the, what I'm saying is, when Elijah began to cut up the bull, it was a bloody mess. Think about it. He got it and he just, I can imagine him slicing the throat. Just, and it says he cut it into pieces. So he bloody, right? He's completely bloody. He built an altar of stones, 12 of them. And they dug trench around the altar. We don't know. So these are not little tiny stones. We're talking about stones. You know, it probably took a man with all the weight and they dug it, he dug a trench around it. And he filled with water. We read how many gallons. Now he's bloody. So we have to understand that he took the bull and it was bloody and he put on the altar. It had to be a pretty big sized altar. It wasn't a little altar. The meat scattered. So let's assume, for the sake of assuming, it was about this big. Right here. Right the altar. Because here's where some of you would be today. All bloody up in the spirit. Yeah. And he put it there. Okay, you see the picture now? He's bloody. Yeah. Let's keep reading. He piled the wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. So the wood, pieces of, of, of bull. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. So now you get these big jars, large jars. They had jugs, they didn't have like little kind of peanut butter jars. We're talking about large jars, large jars, jugs. And, these, and they got the jars, four of them, and now they got water all the way around it ready, and they drenched the wood, right? And the, and the meat with water, soaked it, okay? You see the picture now? After he had done this, he said, do the same thing again. So then he got four more. And he drenched it with more water. Right? And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So that's 12 large jars of water. What is that? 10 gallons? Just get pouring it and pouring it and pouring it. Right? And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench. So you have the trench full of water all the way around because there's so much water. Then you have the, the altar soaked. You see the picture? Okay, now let's move on. See, this battle was an issue of worship. And Isaiah was saying to the people, who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship their God or my God? I would say the same thing. Who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship the God of the world, the God of self, or are you going to worship my God. Right? That's the battle. Elijah's worship invited God to demonstrate himself. He said, God, demonstrate yourself. This encounter teaches us four things that we learned over the last several weeks. Huh? We have to have a relationship with God. We need to repent. We, he has to be ruler. And that ruler has to be seen and proven by your changed life. So if, if you say all oh, is good, but your life didn't change, then something, you missed something down the road. If you're still doing the same thing that you've been doing five, six, seven years, something happened in the beginning. Right? So he, he takes them there. For worship to be what it needs to be, listen, if you really, really want to worship God, does anybody really want to worship God? Yes. Then if you really want to worship God, your relationship needs to be right with Him. Yes. You must be in right relationship with God. Right. Hello, so say, I'm right. Or am I? No, no, I'm not going on that. 
See, Mount Carmel is a culmination of Elijah's intimacy with God. So if something made Elijah have the guts to take that altar and soak it, something did it. Because that took a lot of guts, a lot of moxie, right? So right, for him to say, well, I know if I do this, God's got my back. So he went out there to do this. He had a conversation, a relationship with God where he knew, if I do this, God, you're going to do something. Right? Either that, or he's going to look very, very, very dumb. Right? Could you imagine if God didn't show up? Look at that dummy. He soaked his knee. Wet the wood. Can't even have a barbecue. Huh? He's going to look pretty dumb. See, intimacy, his intimacy, the process that he had was a, was a result of a daily walk and great time. When I say great time, a lot of time with God. And when we talk about as the more time you spend with God determines where you're at. Because there's basically four circles. You have the outer circle. And where most people who walk with God, who say they know God, are dwelling way on the outside. God, hey God, you look real good over there. I don't want to get too close because I know you're gonna, you know, you're gonna make me change things. And I really don't want to change things, but I like you. They're on the outer circle. That's where most people live. Well, they know about God, but they remain distant. The second circle, as you get closer, you spend more time with it, you get deeper, right? Amen? And they get close enough to see God when others can't. Then, then they're, they're getting a little deeper. They got more education, maybe. They, they study the Bible a little bit. Maybe they graduate from home. They have enough Bible in them to do a lot of things. And they've been there, so they know. And they're getting a little deeper. But they, but they know enough to make them afraid to get too deep because they know if they get too deep, they're in trouble because they know. Second circle. Some people just don't know. Right? Then you have the third circle. People, they died of themselves. They, they want it, and they say, I'm going to put myself away. And they actually are getting really intimate. They're starting, to, they're starting to get very intimate with God. Because God is saying, you know, you can do this. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And you're, getting, you're dying to self. You're saying, God, I sacrifice these things. I give them up. I, I'm, 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 I'm using the old man, bro. I'm going to give it up. My, my son brought to my remembrance years ago when I was in, uh, in Hayward. Pastor Steve was preaching a message, and he was talking about the old man barrel. And then we would bring a barrel out, a big, big, giant, 50 gallon barrel. And he would dress up like a bato loco, put shade on it, and then and everything, right? It's a big barrel. He said, Whatever is holding you back to that. Because if you want to get deeper, you want to get into it, whatever you need is holding back, be holding you back to that. You need to read the old man barrel. I ain't talking about that in years. Frank brought up to me uh, yesterday, and, and, I, and I remember when that happened. The first thing that popped in my head, I remember I was in the mission. And the news was going to do an issue with me, right? And so the first thing that popped in my head was, I had to get rid of my regular collection. Now, there's only a regular collection, a regular, you know, a regular car. My own regular collection. But I had, I had regular that I bought in Europe, the UK, Germany, collector albums. Collector. Today, I have a person in my collection I have, it's probably worth about 50 grand. But I knew if I had to Now, I didn't um, want to work out and go, could you show up? I could have sold it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. money yeah. But that's all God said. God said, get busy. He didn't tell him to sell it and make money, because you know you could just buy it. You could have sold it and gave it to the poor. Sounds good, huh? Right? Sounds good. That's what Judas said, when he paid Jesus. So I said, no, nah, I, I could, but God said, get rid of it. So I got rid of it. Because I knew that was holding me back. So when you want to get deeper, it doesn't happen just by happen to chance. God specifically is going to tell you, you need to get rid of this. And your this is not going to be the same as your this. Because then that's when we start changing. Well, why doesn't Jose have to get rid of it? If Jose can keep it, then I can keep it. No, if Jose can keep it, that's on him. Because we all want an independent relationship with God until God can do it. Right? Right? So he asked. But I know that when I gave Rick, got rid of that, it brought me closer to God. Yeah. So that was, I got the better of the deal. Huh? I got rid of all that mess. And all it got me was closer to God. I could this people. And the more, the deeper you want to get with God, listen, the more you're going to have to die the things that you thought you need. 
Now, if you don't want to, that's you. You can stay in the outer circle. It's cool. We love people in the outer circle. We do. We love people in the second circle. But I'm talking about you individually. If you want to get deeper, there's an, op- there's a, 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 an opportunity for you to change right there. We have that inner circle, and then the fourth circle, I call it, is where it's reserved for, for people like Moses. Well, let's get more, uh, let's get to day and age. It's reserved for people like Nikki. It's reserved for people like Pastor Sonny. See, I, I want that inner circle where, where, where someone would preach about me and say, that inner circle is reserved for Pastor Al. But listen, it doesn't have to be that way. That inner circle is reserved for you. It's not just reserved for the, 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 the great preachers of the world. It's reserved for you. But do you want it? See, Isaiah would say, look, there's a battle going on. And this man who had lived in the inner circle came to do something powerfully. See, the only issue that keeps us from advancing towards the inner circle is sin and disobedience. That's it. You want to get closer? Stop sinning. Yeah. You want to get closer? Stop being disobedient. Do you think you're going to get any closer if you, if, you, if you don't change your ways? Right? Hello, somebody. Is anybody here? Yeah. See, Elijah's close relationship with God is revealed by his prayer and his worship. When Elijah came to Mount Carmel, his relationship was already where it needed to be. He had a good relationship, and he says, fill it up with water. Why? See, in that relationship, when you understand, not only be, or rather that, that intimacy and that, that walk with God, first, it begins with relationship, and I know that we have a relationship, but if you want to get deeper and have the right walk with God, then you have to do this every day. Every single day you got to do this. Repent. Amen. Let me say that again. Every single day. You gotta repent. Yeah. Some of you gotta repent right now just for thinking bad things about me. Yeah. You gotta repent. You gotta repent. Huh? Huh? Th- th- this word repentance help us, helps us understand worship. When worship happens, people begin to turn their back to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Right? So Mark Carmel, the story of undecided people, confused, backslidden, misplaced priorities. God was turning them around, bringing them back to God. Elijah was using, or rather God was using Elijah to turn them around. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? See, repentance renews your worship. Without worship, you haven't fully turned away uh, from sin. If you're not really truly repenting and worshiping, you haven't given up your sin. And I know some people have a little pet sin. Yeah, I got this little dog. Uh, Bo. Because his name is Boaz. Biblical name, Boaz. Little white guy. Right? Cute little thing. But some people's sin are, are, cute, are as cute as Boaz. Yeah, you like you, you sin. You, 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 you put it away when you come to church. But when you go and you open the door, you go, Your cute little pet cow that comes running to you. Oh, hi, master. Come jump on your lap. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I'm, I'm really right. Yeah. They got little pet sin that they just, just love. Oh, it's so cute. Que curioso. Que chulito. Mira mi perrito. Right? You got to kill that pet sin. You got to take that dog, put it in the dog pound. Yeah. You got to do whatever you got to do. You got to cut up in pieces, put it on the altar. If you want to get closer to God. Hey, if you, if, you, if you don't want to get closer to God, hey, go ahead. Play, play with your sin until your heart's content. That's on you. All I can, I'm a coach. All I can do is coach you. All I, I'm like a, a traffic signal. All I can do is tell you to stop and go. But you're going to have to put on the gas. You're going to have to put on the brakes. You're going to have to turn left and right. Right? But when you begin to repent, your heart begins to warm towards God. So in the average service today, we have some that are cold and sterile in the worship. Some that are thrilled to come see the church. They love the pastor. They love the music. Others come to be filled with the power and the presence of God. But it's in the presence where if, if, if his presence, it's his presence, in his presence, whether I do good or not, it's in his presence that is significant in my life. Yes. That's it. The only thing that is and if any significance of who Albert Loma is, is that I can walk in his presence. That's it. Yeah. Everything else, who cares? Nothing else impresses me. 
oh, Lord, I can do this, Pastor. And, and, and when, I, when I pray, oh, 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 and, and I don't care about all that stuff. Are you walking with God? Does your life indicate that you have a walk with God? Oh, but you know, Pastor, one last, years ago I was like this. I don't care about years ago. What about right now? I love what Pastor Paul said. We have a lot of Christians. This is a great analogy. Thank you, Pastor Paul. This is a great, he said uh, most Christians are like this. They're walking forward. They're walking forward, right? Towards that door, it's forward. This is how they're walking forward. They're walking forward. We go over here. We walk. They're walking forward, looking backwards. If you walk forward looking backwards, eventually, eventually you're going to get tripped up. See, you got to turn around. And the only way to turn around is you got to, what is it called? It's called repent. See, then you repent. Oh, some of you are walking forward looking back, but who cares what you did in the past? You need to repent and look forward. Uh, go ahead, give the Lord a hand of praise. You can praise Him. Uh, see, if you see Him, you'll walk out of this service changed today. If there's anything good about this service, this morning it's God. If, there, if there's any beautiful, anything beautiful about your life, it's God. It has to be God. If there's anything that changes your life, it's God. So what does that mean? If God is really in you and you walk with Him, then, then the third word that comes to my mind is that He should be ruler of your life. Who rules your life? Who's the ruler? See, God created us to rule. So, but in order for us to be good rulers, we have to be great followers. So before you can be a good ruler, a leader, a preacher, or whatever it is, as a head and a tail, you have to be a great follower of God. Because God, But God created us to rule. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, He says, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule. So in other words, God is saying, I'm going to give up my rulership to man. Let me create man who looks like me, who may talk like me, who may be an image of me. Let us create man in our image. And then he says, and let them rule. But the key is this. Most men do not want to conform to his image. They, they, they want to rule, but they still want to look like the homeboys. They want to rule, but still put makeup on like Catwoman. You know what I'm saying? Huh? They want to rule. No, no, we have to look like God. We have to walk after His image. Let's keep reading. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female. He created them in His image. God blessed them. Then He tells them, be fruitful, increase the number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule. So when we worship, there's an authority that comes to us because He wants us to be rulers. There's a power that comes to us, a boldness that comes to us. What do we say? There's an anointing that falls into our life. Because why? Because God wants us to rule. But do you think He wants some of us to really rule in our current state? I mean, look, don't look around. But if you were to look around, would you want the person sitting near you to be your ruler? Hello, somebody. God said, rule. So he's saying something here. He's saying rule. So in theory, if we were in God's image, listen, if we were in God's image, all of us, then we would have no problem looking around and say, I would love it if Adrian ruled. I would love it huh, if Therese ruled. If, 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 if we were all, if they were in God's image, if they were really Maybe they know. 
And until we get to a point where we're so close to God and we're into with God, when people begin, will start to say, man, I trust that brother. I, don't, I, I would love for him to be my leader. That girl, man, that's the Holy Ghost, full of power, loves the Lord girl. I would love for that woman to be my leader. But until we get to that point, that means a lot of us haven't grown up yet. Well, can I keep preaching like this or are you guys get hurt? You go, out there, out, out. Huh? So, so that, that's what I'm talking about. So when you come out and get mad at somebody for whatever they do to you, well, no, we'll stop a little bit. Would you want you to rule you? Come on, if you're honest with yourself, you look in the mirror, you go, oh, I don't want to be ruler. I'll mess it all up. Yeah. That's why I admire my pastor. Because I can really say, I am grateful. I thank God that I have a leader like Pastor Sonny Argonzoni. I thank God. Thank God. And I pray one day, somehow, some way, that I could prove myself to you in some way that you could say the same. That's my goal. Am I not just for me, but for one day, someone will say the same thing about you. So that I, could, I, I teach you well enough that one day, all of you, you would have people say, I thank God. I thank God that Martin's my ruler. I thank God. Why? Because they've proven themselves over the years. They've gotten closer and closer and closer. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Amen. Hmm. So when we worship, there's an authority that comes. See, Elijah had a powerful anointing at Mark Carmel. He walked with authority. He walked with confidence. He knew, somehow he knew, that no matter how much water he put on that offering, no matter, no matter how much those false prophets dance around, act like fools, no matter how much he would prevail. He knew it. Huh? In 1822, Elijah speaking, Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. He said, I'm the last, imagine that, he was the last prophet. Forget the last of the Mohicans, he was the last prophet. He said, I am left a prophet of the Lord alone. But Baal's prophet, the fault, the liars, the cheaters, the connivers, the ones who maybe talk too much prosperity, the ones who talk and, and, and wink at your sin, the one says, oh yeah, you can be a homosexual and come and be a minister. Those false prophets of Baal, there's all kinds of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of them. Yeah. Hmm? That's how you start out. He says, oh, go, go, go get the ox. Huh? Get the best ox. Cut them up. Put them on the wood. But don't burn it down. Right? That's what got him going. Then he said, then you call on your, the name of your God. You call on the name of your God. Let me say it like this. You call the, on the name of your career. You call on the name of your endeavor. Well, you call on the name of whatever you want to call. I'll call on the name of my God. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what my God will do. Yeah. Huh? He says, then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of, my, of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He's God. Who that bold? Huh? Here's a man who has his worship, who has spent time in worship with God. See, because of his worship life, there is an authority and a rulership. He was in charge. Huh? In charge. There's something good about being in charge. Well, being in charge. Being in charge. So when you're in charge, you can almost sometimes you can make your own rules if you're not careful. That's why we have the word of God. When you're in charge, you got you're holding a higher standard. Because imagine if the person in charge is corrupt, ooh man. I've had that. I've, I've seen leaders in our church, they were corrupt. Right? When they're in charge, it's dangerous. Remind me of a story. St. Peter and Satan. Another one of those stories. They were having an argument one day about baseball. How many love baseball? baseball? With a beguiling leer, Satan proposed a game. Let's play a game on neutral grounds. Huh? Rocky Stadium. 
neither heaven nor hell, between a select team from the heavenly host and my hand-picked Hades players, the devil. Okay, the gatekeeper of the celestial St. Peter said, but you realize, I hope, I hope that we have, and I believe, that we have all the good players. And we have, this is Peter talking neck now, and we have the best coaches too. And Satan goes, I know, but we have all the umpires. Uh, the leadership, the leadership is held to a higher standard. Why? Because you're the umpire. And the umpires can't be corrupt. Well, let me say it again. The umpires can't be corrupt. So in the terms of Major League Baseball, right? I'm the commissioner. And I look for corrupt umpires. I, I, look, I, I devour corrupt umpires. I turn them into the sacrifice. Amen? No, why? Because we have to walk with God. There has to be a renewal of our life. Right? Renewal is the final step. Or let me say like this. Renewal, when you change, that's the result of worship. When you change. Not when you come in here and you sing along with us. Because basically you got to sing along. Not, not only, if you're faithful and you come to church. That's the result of being faithful. Faithful is a good thing. No other reason. But when you are beginning to really transform. Right? Then we say, you know what? This, this person is walking with God. This person really knows God. He's not in the outer circle no more. Just check it out. He's, he's getting dead. This girl is changing. Before, remember when she first came in? Boy, she wanted to beat up everybody. She was talking neck on both sides of her neck. Good thing her head stood on her shoulders. She was just flopping back and forth. <laughs> and she's changing. She ain't the same no more. Right? Because, you know, all of a sudden, this person has she's been walking with God. It's totally different. But there's a renewal. Right? So he did that. He's battling off these, he's battling with these prophets of Baal. And we read it, right? He says, fill it with four large jars of water. Pour it on it. Do it again. Eight bottles of water. That wasn't enough. Do it again. Now a third time. So they did as you said. And the water ran around the altar and overflowed the trench. Huh? See, what we must see here is that when the prophet made the challenge, it was because he was walking with God and God had his back. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God had his back. Not only did God help Elijah, but he also showed the people how puny the prophets of Baal were. Look at how puny these prophets are. Look at their God. They called for four hours, nothing happened. So when God intervenes, he goes the extra mile. The principle isn't that God should just burn the wood. No, I've always said this, we don't serve a God of enough, right? We serve a God of what? More than enough. He, I've always believed in all my heart, when God blesses you, he never gives you what you need. He always gives you more than what you need. Why? Because he's a God of more than enough. He makes us, not a conqueror, but he makes us more than a conqueror. Yes. Right? Jesus, when you begin to tithe and give, you'll give your 10%, but watch his test, you said the Lord. I will give it, he says this, I will press it down, shake it, it'll be overflowing. So when you begin to operate and walk towards God, there's an abundance that begins to happen in your life. Will it happen right away? No, because there's also a testing period, a pruning period, right? There's a time that's junk got to get out of you. But as you're consistent over time, and you're giving, and you're faithful, and you're doing, God says, I'm going to give you more than you ever can imagine. No eye has seen, huh? no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the thing that God will do for those who love Him, who are called. According to his purposes. Yeah, yeah. Huh? That's what we're talking about. Intimacy with God. Yeah. He goes the extra mile. So this principle that God didn't just burn the wood. He burned soaking wet wood. Right. He didn't even want wood. He wants soak it. Your problem, no matter how wet it seems, God will lick it up with fire. You, God will come down on the wet wood of your miserable life and dry it up and consume it with fire. God will fix every need 
every problem, every issue in your life. If you desire to get close to him. If you don't want to get close to him, then you're on your own, Jack. Figure it out. That's how it is. You want him to figure it out? Get close to him. If you want him to kind of figure it out, he won't. You're either with him or you're not. Me? I know my solutions. That would give me a trouble. I already gave up on that part. Me? I want to get as close to God as possible. To God, you got to help the brother. I want you to decide what I do. I want you to decide where I go. I want you to decide everything. Amen. Everything, God. I don't want to decide anything. I want you to decide. Yes. That really, that's one of the reasons why I want to meet with Pastor Sun. Because I want God to decide. And I believe in that man. Amen. I believe that he knows God. And I'm in his ministry. Yes. This is his work. This is his calling. He just allows me to be a part of it. Hmm? See, when God sees you through your problem and is faithful, when God sees you through and he's, and he's faithful, to, he will renew your commitment. He will, he'll say, man, you're going to say, man, I want more of God. I want more. Because, man, he pulled me out. He got me out of trouble. He did it. He delivered. And, oh, there's so many times. My wife knows. So many times, like, man, I don't know what's going to happen. God delivered us. Oh, God. Every time. Hmm? Every time. See, five things are crucial. Five crucial things. When worship. Worship begins with the new perspective. Right? When we really worship God, we see things differently. It begins, it brings a desire to obey God. Right? It gives us a tremendous desire to do anything he asks. Third thing I see as we worship, it helps us to see that God's in control. That God is sovereign. Worship exposes us to God's throne. God is on the throne. Number four, it gives us physical, emotional, and spiritual rest. Let me say it again. It gives, when you know God is in charge and you've given him the right to make all your decisions, then it gives you a rest. Because you're saying, you know what? Then it's, God, it's you. You're going to take care of it because I've given you everything. It's your, and whatever way it goes, it's up to you. Nothing comes to us but by the hand of God, the Bible says. Nothing. If you, if you let him be in charge. It gives you an emotional rest, a physical rest. Hmm? I always tell this, huh? When I'm going, if it's, if it's God's will, let me say it again. If it's God's will, it's His bill. If it's your will, it's your bill. But if it's God's will, it's His bill. So in other words, whatever I do, God's got in control. He's going to have to give everything He needs to do this. God in control. Yeah. Right? Amen. Number five, and we know this, worship brings power. It empowers God's people. Huh? When we worship and lift Him up, we feel strength. The empowering, the anointing is the fruit of worship. The fruit of that close. See, the fruit of worship, the presence of God, the Bible says He, he inhabits the praises of His people. So if you're worshiping God, is anybody worshiping God? If you're worshiping God, then there should be a presence about you. God, there should be something. If you're worshiping God in church and you go home and there's no presence about you, then you're missing something. There should be a... Because God's presence is not just privilege to when we join together. When you're worshiping true worship, in other words, your life is a living sacrifice, God's presence will fall in your but if you can leave here and feel comfortable with sin, my friend, there's something wrong with your worship. Hmm? God's presence. Why? Because we're talking, what are we talking about? Conviction. True worship brings conviction. 
Worship gives not only conviction, but it gives direction. When we see something that's not right, we don't feel right, we know we shouldn't be here. We say, no, nah, I ain't going to do that. I got I to gotta turn. I got I to gotta go somewhere. I got I to gotta get away from this. This is not right. I don't know why it's not right, but it's not right. I don't feel right. Why you don't feel that the God in you, the Holy Spirit, is convicting you and trying to give you direction. No, don't be here. No, don't do this. Be careful. Do you feel this? Listen. Stop listening to yourself. Through the worship, is, there's deliverance. There, there, there's the thing going on I've, I've seen over the years. It's all, I'm going to go to a deliverance service. And they get around, a bunch of ladies praying for deliverance on people. Listen, every service is a deliverance service. If you got to go to a deliverance service, then, then wherever you've been going, stop going. Because you should be delivered. If you're not delivered, it's because you, don't, you like sin. And let's face it, in any church, there are some people who just like sin. And they don't want to change. But for some reason, they keep coming. Okay, that's cool. I'd rather you keep coming and keep sinning than not coming and just keep sinning. Eventually, maybe eventually, boing, the light will turn on. All right. That's better ch- shot. But listen, my friend. If you're worshiping God, there's deliverance. You don't, you're not trapped by, by alcohol. You're not trapped by drugs. You're not trapped by perversion. You're not trapped by lying. You're not trapped by stealing. You're not trapped by anger. You're not, there's nothing greater than God. Nothing greater than God. If you're worshiping, then you're delivered. Right? See, a true worshiper of God, listen, doesn't need a deliverance service. A true worshiper of God, of God is the deliverance. A true worshiper of God is the deliverance service. If you're worshiping God, you will lay hands and they'll recover. You are the deliverance. You are God's hand. You are God's feet. You are God's heart. If you're worshiping God, Hmm? See, when you're worshiping, you have a sensitivity to His voice. Even now, you hear God's voice behind my voice. You hear a voice. You're sensitive. Whichever way He chooses to speak, your ear will be tuned to the Holy Ghost frequency. You're right on cue. You hear. You know. Because there's a sensitivity to His voice. God is speaking to you. Now, the trick is, are you listening to that voice? And lastly, when you're worshiping God, you have an eternal perspective on life. Yes, we live life. Yes, we make business deals. Yes, we, we're faithful to our job. We're, we, we get there early, we leave late. Yes, we, 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 when we own and we make business deals, we give the best always. Why not? Because we're representing our company, because we're representing God. Yes. Huh? But with all that in play, we have an eternal perspective of life. We're doing this till Jesus comes. We're just occupying enemy territory till Jesus returns. We're just doing what we got to do and making as much money so we can give to the ministry so we can conquer the world for the Lord. So we can, we, can, we can win treasures of darkness. We can go to every inner city of the world so that this church in particular, we can grow and we can begin to plant churches in the Pacific Rim. That's why we're doing That's why I'm here. I'm not here to build a church. I'm here to go out to Asia and take Asia for Jesus. That's why I'm here. Now, I might have tricked you and brought you to church, but I'm just trying to get you on board to see the vision. Vision-driven, mission-minded. That's why I'm here. I sit here and I, 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 made, I found out what my goal in life is. And I can say it very simply. My goal in life is to help Pastor Sonny build the church as I can. And I have no other goal. I have no other desire. I have no other want. I have no other dream. My goal in life is to help build the church as good as I can with little I have and then die. There's no hint in it. There's nothing more. You want to know that? That's me. That's it. Vision driven. Mission minded. If you, think, if you thought there was more, I'm sorry I let you down. That's it. If you're with me, praise the Lord. 
If you're not, I can't do nothing about that. There's a lot of great churches. My job is to preach the gospel and our vision and, and draw people that are attracted to that. If, if we get you saved, get you cleaned up in the home, and you go somewhere else, that's, I did my part. At least you're not in the gutter no more. But if you want to stick with us, if you want a vision, if you want a purpose in life, you come to the right place. You come to the right place. You come to the right place. I want every head bowed, every eye closed.